How many times have you logged on to your favorite streaming service in the mood for a little giggle? You turn to the comedy section, ready to find a funny movie you might not have seen before just to have a light-hearted time. And what do you find? Oh, it's Adam Sandler on an island again doing stuff. Oh, another terrible remake of an old classic. A bunch of random rom-coms you have no interest in watching. Kids movies that get shoved under the comedy umbrella. And I'm not talking about Shrek 2. That's a good movie. So you end up watching a classic from 30 years ago despite OJ Simpson being in it? Hi, I'm Gabby and welcome back to the channel. <laughs> this is an intro, I don't know, I felt like I should start introducing myself even though I never do. So now I just made it weird. I. It's fine. You can call me Vector for all I care. After looking at every streaming service I could get my little hands on or free trial because that gets more expensive than cable real fast and examining all the comedy movies that streaming had to offer, I can now categorize the comedy movie category into a few set categories. How many times did I say category? It seems that every comedy section consists of mostly movies for kids, rom-coms, holiday movies, Kevin Hart, Adam Sandler, dramedies, or classics from 10 plus years ago. Like so much of this section aren't even comedy movies. Besides the children's movies, holiday films, and rom-coms, do the rest of the comedies that have come out in the past five years really stand on their own at all? Or even considered good? You can tell we're lacking in good comedies when the only dedicated comedy movies on streaming services are more than a decade old. When genres like action or drama have nothing short of exceptional recent films. Is J-Lo's biography really a comedy? Saltburn, a comedy? Come on now. Once upon a time in Hollywood, that's just- I don't know if this has happened to anyone else, but half the time when I'm looking for a new comedy to watch, I'll choose a movie, start watching it, only to realize it's not a fucking comedy. It's a drama with two jokes in it that got lost in the comedy section. And I'm not talking about black comedies here. I'm talking about movies like Don't Look Up that were so goddamn boring that I think it forgot it was supposed to be funny. How big is this thing going? I can't destroy my ex-wife's house. Is that possible? <laughs> There's a 100% chance that we're all going to die! Oh, brother, this guy stinks! And I'm not against genre fusion. I think action comedies are like bread and butter. Horror comedies are like peanut butter and jam. But traditional comedies lately have taken a huge hit. I mean, big name movies have just been absolutely flopping. The Wrong Missy was really meh. Old Dads was a really mixed movie. <laughs> just rub some dirt on it. You might want to put a little Neosporin on it. I think you get infected. Oh yeah? Are you a doctor? Are you just like one of those WebMD guys? This is common knowledge. You want to keep the cut clean. Well, listen, I'm trying to raise a little man here, not a fucking pussy. So why don't you just go on Twitter and go share this story where you're the hero? Ugh. You People was a really tired, bad, it was just, people just thought it was bad. No Hard Feelings was also mixed. People thought it was really creepy that Jennifer Lawrence's character was like 30 and she was being paid to date an 18 year old. People felt it was less funny and more fucking weird. Although I ended up scrolling so far down that I ended up on Michael Bolton's big sexy Valentine's Day special, so. I'll have to take a look at that later. I mean, you know the comedy section is lit when you see Tall Girl 1 and 2 on there. Not to mention He's All That, the worst brand placement sequel to She's All That. Thank God we have that. Mean Girls, the worst seventh sequel to Mean Girls. White Men Can't Jump with Jack Harlow, the worst sequel to White Men Can't Jump without Jack Harlow. Just so we're clear, transparent, not opaque, good comedies still exist and are still being made. I'm not the almighty judge of good comedy, but it's pretty obvious when it's bad, even if you can't put a finger on it. I know that much. In the past five or so years, I thought Free Guy was fun. Bad Trip was a hilarious Borat style hidden camera type comedy. The Weird Al satire movie. 80 for Brady, the movie about old ladies getting into hijinks to see Tom Brady at the Super Bowl so they see ghostly visions of him giving pep talks to them, the cult classic with just me in it, I'm the cult. There are good comedies being made, I just feel like few of them actually make it into the mainstream pop culture for being well written and good. Barbie is one of them, in a time where I feel like cult classic comedies were a stone's throw away in like the early 2000s. My personal observation as a casual movie watcher is that classic comedies have kind of fallen out of mainstream. Whether that be us falling out of love with the genre, studios not investing 
something in the genre or a mix of both. And I'm not the first or only one to notice this. An article on the LA Times mm. says that at a time when comedy is enjoying a boom on the small screen and streaming stand-up comedy is easier than ever, the genre can't seem to shake a big screen slump. And this is showing evidently in the box office too. In favor of artsy dramedies that kind of lean more on the side of drama than comedy or um... Adam Sandler, <laughs> Kevin Hart, and The Rock, and like John Cena starring in these incredibly generic, forgettable comedies. There's nothing wrong with a good dramedy, but when a harrowing film like Parasite is being considered a comedy by articles, Google, the Oscars, and streaming services, because it has like two kinda lighthearted moments in it, it doesn't quite feel like it makes sense here. We'll talk more about that later, but first I wanna talk about the current state of comedy films. But first, first, I wanted to address something, and that's that you can't pay to see my feet. But Bombas can! The most comfortable socks, slippers, shirts, underwear that you will ever invest in. And feel good about because each purchase gets donated to people experiencing homelessness. And Bombas has already donated a hundred million essential clothing items across a network of over 3,500 giving partners across the US. I'm so excited to partner with Bombas because I've just heard about how comfortable they are and all my socks get holes in them or infuriatingly slip off of my ankles when I'm wearing shoes. So I'm excited to have pairs that actually last, not have annoying toe seams, and have great colors. And they have more neutral color options if you want. I just like colors. And they also have these gripper slippers that are so comfortable and cozy and soft. These are real cloud slippers, if you know what I mean. Head over to bombas.com slash Gabby and use the code Gabby20 at checkout to get 20% off your first purchase. Gabby20, super easy to remember at checkout at bombas.com slash Gabby. And now back to movies. Me Time is a Kevin Hart movie where he plays a stay-at-home dad with crazy best friend Mark Stay Prayed Up Wahlberg. Stay prayed up. Stay prayed up. Stay prayed up. Kevin Hart's movie family is going on vacation or something, so he finally gets a little bit of me time for himself because he's always so busy doing everything while his wife works a traditional job. Mark Wahlberg's shenanigans have no arc or reason, and he doesn't grow as a character at all, and many of the scenes just aren't funny or well thought out to what's actually funny about it besides yelling. <laughs> At the end, Kevin admits to being super micromanagey in this hard to watch emotional monologue where he just saves the day by doing stand up. I hope he didn't use it again, but if he did, he ate ass. And guess what? Instead of resolving themes that were set up like gender roles, work around the house and how tired he's been. Sonny, you have no life outside of your kids. Well, my wife is an architect. We made a decision that's best for me to take care of the kids. It's called a system which works. Yeah, prison system. That's what it sounds like. Which you can resolve comically as well. He only addresses the micromanaging his kid's dreams thing, which was not really set up as the main issue in the beginning. The ending speech and resolution with his wife was confusing, underwhelming, and could have been put together a lot more cohesively. Because every sentimental scene that they tried to tie in here just felt really discombobulated and out of place. Bad Mom's Christmas might be the unfunniest piece of media I've seen in a long time that was was actually trying to be a comedy. And I love bad movies, but this wasn't enjoyable bad, this was boring bad. Maybe the fact that it's a Christmas movie automatically bestows a bad movie curse onto it, who knows for sure. It again follows people who haven't had a day off in a long time and all of their mother-in-laws unexpectedly fly in for Christmas. At first, I thought this was labeled wrong on Netflix because I was confused on whether or not this movie was trying to be funny. The jokes feel dated in the worst way. All the scenes are shot the same, the scenes linger far past their welcome, because the pacing of every joke and scene was so frustrating that I wanted to turn it off several times throughout, because the entire movie is spent waiting for the part where they become bad moms. But it never happens. It struggles to fill the hundred minute runtime. It devolves into cheap emotional fodder that feels empty and not earned, because it was so unfunny leading up to it. This movie was so disappointing to 
me because all of the actresses in this movie have really solid comedy credentials, but with material this bad to work with, no one could save this mess. Girls Trip is again people who haven't had a day off in a long time and have drifted apart, getting back together to make one of their work trips to New Orleans a girls trip. This was definitely the better one on this list. The characters felt a bit more real. Tiffany Haddish is one of the funniest parts of this movie. It's a hangover style raunchy comedy, but they tried to weave in this super serious storyline about one of the girl's husbands cheating on her. And in this raunchy comedy, it really took me out of it. It almost felt like emotional whiplash because it was trying to be this super sentimental movie with serious moments and serious themes while still being a raunchy comedy. Palm Springs was an interesting take on the Groundhog Day stuck in a time loop situation. Andy Samberg's been stuck on someone's wedding day for quite a while now, and this girl follows him into the time vortex and now she's stuck in the time loop with him. I like the twist in concept, however, they were trying to go for dramedy, but it left me feeling lacking in the drama and the comedy aspects of the film. They try to touch on nihilism and living every day in a time loop and the existential crisis that come with it, while also trying to have gut-busting comedy moments that just end up making me eye roll. Because the time loop life metaphor is not only done worse than a movie like Groundhog Day, but they lay it out and explain it to you over and over and over again without letting us interpret the story. I get it. Oh, we're stuck in a time loop. It's a metaphor for everyday life. Don't you think this is crazy? It's almost like nothing matters in the end. They reiterate that point to ad nauseum. Pain is real. Why can't you understand that? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters, right? Those are your words. No, pain matters. What we do to other people matters. Being a source of terror is not fun, okay? It's not fulfilling. I know this from experience. It doesn't matter that everything resets and people don't remember. We remember. We have to deal with the things that we do. Oh my God. I'm just kidding. There is no God. Are you scared to leave? What? No. I just don't want to leave. I can't keep waking up in here. It's all meaningless, right? I mean, I hope it's not all meaningless. Today, tomorrow, yesterday, it's all the same. The only way to really live in this is to embrace the fact that nothing matters. Well, then what's the point of living? Well, we kind of have no choice but to live. So I think your best bet is just to learn how to suffer existence. At the end of the story, the girl is like randomly good at quantum physics and they blow up the time vortex and that's how they get out of it. Straight up losing any sort of deep meaning that the movie was trying to have. Especially when they throw in half-baked sentimental moments that have no real lead-up consequences that make the film feel messy instead of striving for a purpose. So it just spells out the message for you instead. It's not the fact that the moment is serious, but the fact that it spelled out a little too much, which is something I've grown to loathe in these modern comedies. I feel like many modern comedies fail to strike that balance between comedy and serious writing, that it ends up losing its identity of what it's trying to be as a film, when it's trying to do too much, because they think that these like shooed in serious moments make the movie better, more credible or substantial or something. It really takes you out of the crazy world that these movies have built when they try to sit there there and explain the message to you out loud. Hey guys, cheating is bad and we're going to explain why. Hey guys, I must let my kid follow his dreams. Actually, nothing matters, which is why that this time loop is a metaphor for exactly that. Even movies like Superbad is about something a little more than just teen comedy. It's a critique of things that teenage boys chase after and idolize that are typically fruitless without shoving the message down our throats with some out of place serious PSA monologuing, which is something that's that's evident in the shift away from traditional comedy into drama, action, and spectacles on the big screen. I think it's less that audiences don't want to see comedy in a theater and more that they do want to see a spectacle in the theater. TV is so good at providing drama and comedy that the movie theater is becoming one of the only places you can see things on a grand stage. The director for Deadpool and Zombieland said in an interview with the LA Times, it's sort of a chicken and the egg situation because if less people are going to see comedies in theaters, do studios enter twine drama to try to reel people back in? Or are these poorly written plots causing people to stray away from the genre?
The state of new comedies have just been taken over by storylines happening to big name celebrity, where that's almost the spectacle of the movie, instead of them embodying a character moving through a story. Like, oh look, it's The Rock being The Rock again in every movie. <laughs> I couldn't name a single character name that he's had in any movie. SNL members and other giants in comedy taking over decades of films is not new to the genre of comedy. The genre has been personality cult-based forever. Faces you wouldn't stop seeing for 10, 20 years straight. So it should it should be fine that something similar is happening now with familiar faces. If the movies weren't just mid, or worse, completely forgettable, something about them have just lost their spark to me. I feel like a lot of these new comedies have lost their passion for, for comedy writing. The finesse, it almost feels very corporate and laid out at times. They fall flat on safe, predictable dialogue, generic plots, tropes, characters, and generally feel uninspired and canned. You can take a predictable plot, like nerds try to do something before they graduate that's been done a million times, and still have the jokes land and be an enjoyable film because of the cinematography, setups, payoffs, writing, and really good performances from the actors, when it can be really easy to just overact and resort to yelling as the joke, which can be funny at the right time. There's a periodic air pockets we encountered. There's no reason to become alarmed, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your flight. By the way, is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? But someone's performance of a joke or scene has to be just right. If not, the whole thing falls apart, even if you have good everything else. If anything in the chain is just off or wrong, then it all falls apart. Which is why I think doing comedy is so difficult and not as effortless as it seems. Great comedy looks effortless, but it's probably the hardest genre from a filmmaking standpoint. The currency of these movies is not the budget or the special effects. The currency is the comedy, and if the comedy isn't there, it erodes the goodwill of the audiences, which just sends them right back to the small screen, where they have so many options. Says senior box office analyst for Comscore in an interview with the LA Times. Oh, <sighs> like in stand-up, when it's bad, Boy, is it bad. All of the eyes are on the writing, the performance, and the joke. I was talking to a friend who I think is a really good comic, and it can take people like up to half a decade to write a really good stand-up set with all the revisions and versions it goes through to be the funniest it can be. A wonderful example of nothing working from script to screen is MGK's stoner comedy. I reviewed that movie two years ago and I will not let it go. We had plenty of joke ideas, but the ex execution overall was terrible from script to editing and performance. Take this scene for example that is a classic slapstick style misunderstanding. My phone's dead, fuck. Do you have a charger? Uh, yeah, there's one in the glove compartment. It's a lot of gloves. Well, yeah, silly, it's the glove compartment. Right. There aren't strict rules for comedy that always have to be followed, but this scene specifically had a lot of pacing issues. I felt like the shot held on for too long, pensive music that could have been done without to really let the moment linger. They spoiled the joke by showing us the glove reveal right away, and they could have played around with different types of reactions. Compare it to this scene from Napoleon Dynamite. Are you gonna eat your tots? No. Can I have them? The delivery is believable, the way he grabs the tots on the table is funny, but then it cuts to him unzipping his pocket and trying to shove them all in there with one falling out, cutting to Pedro's perfect blank reaction. There's a lot of little things working together to make this scene funny, including the camera work and the editing, when it could have easily relied on the whole joke being, oh, he grabbed some tater tots funny and shoved them in his pocket, how weird is that, without showing us any of the things that they did. The 
The few movies I mentioned obviously aren't representative of the entire comedy genre right now, but unfortunately they are kind of representative of mainstream comedy films right now because these are the movies being shown to the casual movie enjoyer. It's really hard for me to verbalize exactly why I feel this way about a lot of these movies. I don't know if I just don't love the acting, if my sense of humor doesn't align with current trends because I, I literally find this funny, or if it's a mix of generally everything or if I'm just not the target audience. Which could definitely be the case because I don't mean to come in here with rose-tinted glasses and be like, old comedy is good, new comedy is bad. Because the classics we remember are the best ones from that era, when not all of them hit and not all of them were my taste. For example, I don't love Adam Sandler or Will Ferrell movies, even the classics. And Dude Where's My Car is a terrible stoner comedy that I didn't find very funny despite despite how popular it is. Some of my least favorite comedies include the shit stain that is Sausage Party, and even beloved actors like Mike Myers that have made comedy classics have made widely regarded unfunny films. I just feel like we have less of those comedies that I really see sticking around to be classics in the future. Each decade had its classic comedies, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s had a really healthy handful of quality comedy classics that people still quote and remember fondly today. None of them won Oscars, but the cultural impact that these movies had is nothing to laugh at, or everything to laugh at if you know what I mean. I just find myself going back to the old classics or discovering new old ones that I haven't seen yet. This wasn't always the case, but in the past 10 years or so, why do comedies need to be intertwined with like 50% drama in order for it to be critically acclaimed? Can the comedy not stand on its own? Can the comedy not stand by itself with its own two legs? I got curious about this, so I looked further into the end all be all, the arbiter of truth in film artistry, and that's the Oscars. I don't care about the Oscars, I know a lot of you don't either, but it was really telling when I looked into what the last comedy film was to win an Oscar for Best Picture, and they showed movies that were straight up not comedies. Number one on the list was Parasite. It's a great movie, and many say deserved to win Best Picture, especially a foreign film finally getting the recognition and representation it deserves, but it's not a comedy. <laughs> it's just not. All the comedies that have ever won Best Picture are from like the 1930s to 1960s. A couple of them were musicals, and the other ones were foreign. Forrest Gump and Everything Everywhere All at Once, which are not really comedies. Just because a movie has a few comedic moments in it, does it really count as a comedy film? I'm not gonna sit here and lay out like the Merriam-Webster Oxford definition of what a comedy film is, but you, you can kind of just like tell. Either way, this makes it feel like for a comedy film to be highly regarded, even in pop culture, it has to be paired with quality drama, moody lights, artsy cinematography, and just about everything else that isn't focused on the comedy. Movies like Mean Girls, White Chicks, 13 Going on 30, Freaky Friday, Legally Blonde, Super Bad, Groundhog Day, etc. relies on good comedic storytelling with dramatic moments to help realize the purpose of the story, but the film relies on comedy and is consistent throughout. I'm not saying a movie has to have zero low or unfunny moments in order to count as a comedy, but many recent comedy films are now the other way around. It's a drama film with moments of comedy. That's just best picture, but there have been comedic performances that have won Oscars. None from the past two decades, though, besides Melissa McCarthy's performance in the 2011 film Bridesmaids. Listen, I know Oscars literally don't mean shit. I'm not letting the Academy decide what movies everyone thinks is good. They won't even show their faces. But it does seem like a common sentiment across what we consider to be exceptional media. We all know and are familiar with acting that is passionate, dramatic, moody, angry that make us go wow what passion holy cow he's acting yep <laughs> That's acting, all right. And we've all learned to appreciate the small, subtle moments of great acting, like subtle facial expressions and body language that really sell a performance. But what about comedy acting? It's really easy to gloss over comedic acting because actors who are good at it make it look so effortless. We often gloss over it in hindsight. Being a great comedic actor, in my opinion, takes just as much skill and talent as any other type of acting. But I feel it doesn't get the same appreciation all the time. 
Or maybe it does, I don't know. Like any genre, when the acting is bad, the entire film can lose momentum and really take you out of it, even if everything else is on point. Well, it is unfortunate. Unfortunate? My ex-husband's hiking accident was unfortunate and he was mauled by bears. Yes, girl, give us nothing. I love it. It can struggle to convey the proper mood and implications of the scene. And in traditional comedy films where the entire focus is on the jokes, when the joke falls flat, there might not be much else for the film to stand on, which is why I think it can be so hard. The delivery of a joke or punchline can make or break the scene. And that's only if the comedy writing is good too, which hasn't had the best reputation. This scene will live in my brain forever. Is there anything off between him and Luigi? Uh, yes, I, I hate for it to come out like this, but Luigi was sleeping with Princess Peach, Mario's wife. <laughs> the last appreciation posts I've seen for comedy acting come in the form of The Office YouTube compilations. Reminiscing on perfect casting choices, worshipping this TV show so much that it's become a stereotype for cringe millennial core in the same vein as diehard Harry Potter fans. But I don't care. It's a good show. But it's crazy how you can have different actors deliver the same exact joke in the same exact setting and it will just hit completely differently. So it's crazy how something like a casting choice can affect the character, the delivery, the lines so much. But I'm getting off topic here because we're talking about movies. We all know exceptional cinematography when we see it, with meaningful lighting, angles, shots that present an unspoken mood or dynamic. But where's the credit for good comedic cinematography that can really help to exemplify or support a joke? Or sometimes the way the shot is set up is the joke. Gonna work. Cannot do Tuesday. Mom, 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 mom. Sean, 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 Sean! See how annoying that is! Director Kay Cannon said, It's harder to make comedies good because audiences are so savvy and they've seen a lot. You can have a horror movie that's just okay and people will go see it because scaring someone is easier than making them laugh. A comedy has to be great. And this is the case with movies in general, right? Audiences find out lightning fast now if a movie sucks and the box office will suffer from that. A movie has to be really good for people to go see it. Maybe the environment has changed where crappy comedy comedies can't trick you into coming anymore because you'll find out too fast on Twitter. But when someone makes an amazing movie, people tend to go. Especially with so much other available quality entertainment out there, many doing comedy better, it's probably harder now than it was back then. There are so many star-studded flops these days that I'm convinced studios think the star power will bring in the dollars alone. Which is partially probably why traditional comedies just go straight to streaming now, to avoid the box office flop entirely. So it's not that deep but let's explore this as if it is. The decline of traditional comedies being made and the rise in dramedies that explore deeper themes is not out of nowhere. As some philosopher probably said at some point, Art reflects society. Art reflects what's going on in society because art is created by society. Wow, that's so deep. If traditional comedies aren't being made as much, that must partially mean that the masses might not be as interested in them anymore. Maybe in favor of other types of media. I think if we circle back and look at the bigger picture, widen the lens, zoom out, we can start to understand the context in which our favorite movies were being made. Largely a time before the boom in social media, a time where we didn't have immediate access to the worst news imaginable, people could shelter themselves more from what was really going on in the the world. And comedy films could be a light-hearted diversion from reality. But now we can no longer escape reality as it follows us everywhere we go. So we blend these genres that help us find humor and complex or darker themes that help us navigate and explore how we feel. People now crave stories that reflect our complex world, finding solace in movies that mirror our own struggle. There's always been comedy in dark situations. There's just this different juxtaposition of comedy and drama that's reflected in our media. Or maybe they just need to start writing better comedies. I'd still like that. That would be great. I'm not trying to make comedy movies seem like a super deep and serious contentious topic when it's really probably not that deep, but I just wanted to appreciate my favorite movie genre ever. I've seen more comedy films than any other type of film. I am always looking for a comedy to watch and this is just something that I've noticed. And if you're about to tell me how terrible my view on movies is, uh, don't worry. All of my friends and loved ones 
ones have already done that. I'm aware I have a terrible taste in film. I watch movies to escape the terrible realities of the world, not to live further in them. I don't need a movie to make me cry. I can do that on my own. Anyway, all that to say, Shrek 2 is the best movie of all time. Thank you.